Good morning. Welcome to the United States Coast Guard Academy. I'm Richard Zuchek, the head of the Department of Humanities, and I'll be taking you on a little tour today of the Coast Guard Academy Museum. The museum is in Weishi Hall, named for Russell Weishi, who was the Commandant of the Coast Guard during the Second World War. Weishi Hall also has the Admissions Division, the Coast Guard Library, study areas and classrooms for officer candidates, and the Coast Guard's Museum. The Coast Guard's Museum tells two different stories, and, and, and in some ways it's, it's a, a different kind of museum than you might be used to. It certainly is a narrative of the Coast Guard's history from beginning to, to today. But it also tells the story of the five ancestor agencies, the five different units that came together to form the United States Coast Guard. The Lighthouse Service, the Life Saving Service, the Revenue Cutter Service, the Steamboat Inspection Service, and the Bureau of Marine Investigation and Navigation. Those five eventually formed today's Coast Guard. We begin at the beginning, and the story of the Revenue Cutter Service and the Coast Guard always begins with Alexander Hamilton, who we claim to be the founder of the Coast Guard. Remember that Alexander Hamilton is George Washington's Secretary of the Treasury the first Secretary of the Treasury, and he faced an incredible task. How does a government raise money after fighting a war against taxes? And the solution is the Tariff Act of 1789. Collect tariffs, taxes, that are not on Americans. To do this, the government passed the Tariff Act of 1789 and then proceeded to build what was called a system of cutters. Those cutters would enforce tariff and revenue regulations coming into the new United States. That is how the original American Republic paid for itself. But from the beginning, these revenue cutters were not just law enforcement, but they were very multi-mission. This opening corridor of the museum lays out some of the other roles and missions of the revenue cutters. Revenue cutters were involved in stopping piracy. The revenue cutters were involved in coastal navigational surveys. The revenue cutters even enforced pathogenic quarantines. It was the revenue cutter service that put people who were suffering from something contagious onto ships out into the ocean. That's where they were quarantined. A little bit different than we have now under COVID. Uh, very much more draconian. Right. Um, and the Revenue Cutter Service, from its beginning, was a military organization. The Revenue Cutter Service and the United States Coast Guard has taken part in every military conflict in American history. For example, one of the first displays you come across is this model of the Harriet Lane. Right. Harriet Lane was top of the line when it came out in the early 1850s. Dual propulsion, dual side wheeler, steam and sail, named for the niece of the president, James Buchanan. Harriet Lane was very fond and had a great relationship with the Treasury Department and the revenue cutters. Harriet Lane was on blockade duty in April of 1862. And it is while it is outside Charleston that it fires the first naval shot of the American Civil War, as a ship that was unflagged and unnoted was coming into harbor. Okay. And that way it began the Coast Guard, the Revenue Cutter Service's role in the American Civil War. Most students know the Harriet Lane because it's the longest road at the Academy. The main north-south thoroughfare on the Academy is Harriet Lane, or more properly, Harriet Lane Road named for the ship that's named for the president's niece. As I was saying, the Revenue Cutter Service was a military organization. Right? Uh, one of the largest displays here at the Academy is one of the Dahlgren uh, pivot guns. These, these were designed for revenue cutters uh, in the 19th century for helping with amphibious operations uh, and, and ship to shore operations. Uh, the gun is actually on a rail so that it can, it can swivel on the bow or the stern of a ship. 
Okay? The, the revenue cutter service used stuff like this uh, in the war with Mexico in the 1840s and in the war with Spain in the 1890s. Speaking of the war with Spain, most people don't know that the revenue cutters operated in Puerto Rico, in Cuba, and even in the Philippines. Here in this case, we have the battle streamer from the Spanish-American War. Just below it is a congressional coin struck in honor of a Coast Guard unit that was serving at Cardenas Bay in Cuba. The crew of the Coast Guard cutter Hudson ended up saving three Navy ships that had lost propulsion and were trapped under Spanish guns. Right? Their heroic efforts, saving those crews in those ships, pulling them to safety, earned them this medal from Congress. For those of you who come to campus, when you go to Bear Drive along Washington Parade Field, you'll notice six black guns along the sidewalk. Those guns are from the Spanish ship Riena Cristina, which was the flagship in the Philippines. Those guns were presented to the revenue cutter, McCulloch, that was at the Battle of Manila Bay. But the fascinating thing about the United States Coast Guard and its ancestor services is this hybrid nature I mentioned before, that while we have examples of wartime service, we also have a very deep core of humanitarian service, life-saving service. So just beside the Spanish-American streamer, we have, for instance, the placard discussing the Pea Island Life-Saving Station. Pea Island, on the coast of North Carolina, was an all-African-American life-saving station, highly regarded by peers and by the life-saving service. In fact, this entire crew received gold life-saving medals in 1896 when they rescued the entire crew and all passengers from the E.S. Newman, which had wrecked on the shoals off North Carolina. That's a success story. The museum houses lots of artifacts. Among my favorite is one that isn't a success story. Ms. Gaudio, the curator and I are very fond of this wooden item. This is a life-saving ring. It is a prototype. Luckily, it opens up on a hinge. You put it around your neck, you snap it closed, and you jump into the water when your ship is in distress. I don't need to explain to all of you that wood floats. Body hitting water does not. We are very lucky this is only a prototype because you can just imagine what it would do to anyone actually using it. In talking about the ancestor services and the humanitarian role of the United States Coast Guard, um, we certainly have to talk about one of its ancestor services that focused on life saving specifically, and that is the life-saving service. These are some of the tools of the trade in the life-saving service. Okay. Uh, this is unceremoniously called a life car. Very practical. Right? Uh, it fits four to six people and is used for pulling people off ships that are wrecked near the coast. If you just have one or two people you're worried about, say a private schooner or something like that, you would use the breech buoy which cadets refer to as the giant diaper. Now, how do you get people into these? How do you actually use these? Well, the invention of the Lyle gun, this brass cannon I'm looking at here, is how it's done. Life-saving service crews, such as Pea Island, for instance, would learn how to equip this cannon with a line. There's a line in a box here next to it. You'd fire the line onto the distressed vessel, and then hook up a rigging system to be able to either pull the breech buoy or pull the life car. That's what these giant rings are for. There's one uh, both fore and aft in order to pull the car back and forth to the distressed vessel. One of the people who, who really supports this sort of development is a guy by the name of Sumner Kimball. 
That name might be familiar to those of you who know Coast Guard cutters. Sumner Kimball was the head of the Revenue Marine. And as such, he pushed things like training, standardization, protocol, uniforms, pay. Right? And in many ways, he took what was a volunteer slipshod organization and really made it into something professional and efficient so that lifesavers weren't dying, saving other people's lives. Just happen to have a portrait of Sumner Kimball right here. Okay? The reason I bring up Sumner Kimball is he is very important to the United States Coast Guard Academy. It is Kimball who recognizes you need professional people, trained people, educated people. And for years, it is Sumner Kimball who pushes the idea of a school to create revenue cutter officers. He's successful in 1876. Congress authorizes appropriations to create the Revenue Cutter School of Instruction, the birth of the Coast Guard Academy. You're all very familiar with one of his key ideas. He convinced Congress that this school would admit people by merit only. He wanted no role for congressional appointments. He wanted it to be completely based on the best people getting in. That was written into legislation in 1875-76. And that is why the United States Coast Guard Academy still uses no congressional appointments. Some other life-saving elements that we talk about on a bigger scale is the Coast Guard's role in the Arctic. You're studying foreign policy, international relations, environmental studies, you're gonna study about the Arctic. The Revenue Cutter Service is the US government entity in the Arctic. No one is up there but the revenue cutters. They are enforcing whaling, enforcing sealing. They are bringing food and medicine to natives. Okay. They are laying the groundwork after 1867, when the United States buys Alaska, laying the groundwork for this territory to be American sovereign territory. The famous Mike Healy, CEO of the Bear, one of the most famous cutters in Coast Guard history, um, he, of course, is the guy who brings reindeer over from Siberia to help feed the natives. Okay. He is also the first African American to command a US warship. It's just no one knows he's African American. He hides it and plays up his Irish blood, his Irish side, and plays down his African American side successfully. That story resonates because those reindeer are not just food for the natives. 10 years later, in 1897, three whaling ships get stuck above the Arctic Circle when the ice arrives early. They can't get out. And 265 guys are gonna die. The revenue cutter bear goes up and launches what's called the Overland Expedition. Lieutenant Ellsworth Bertoff takes a crew of revenue cutter volunteers, finds native guides, and they trek over 1,200 miles to the trapped whaling ships, bringing food and bringing medicine. The food they bring is, of course, a herd of reindeer, going back 10 years to Mike Healy. Interesting connections. Right? These are Ellsworth Bertoff's snowshoes from the famous Overland Expedition. They reach the whalers after 1,200 miles of trekking, get them the food, get them the medicine, and by spring of 98, when the ice melts, revenue cutters are able to come in and rescue them. We move into the 20th century. It's very hard to avoid the impact of the world wars, and in particular, the Second World War, on the globe, uh, and also on the United States Coast Guard. As I mentioned earlier, the United States Coast Guard or the Revenue Cutter Service earlier, has participated in every military conflict in American history. World War II was no exception. The display behind me highlights Coast Guard activity in both theaters, the Pacific Theater and the European Theater. For instance, uh, the portrait behind me, the picture behind me, is Lieutenant James Crotty, United States Coast Guard. Lieutenant Crotty was captured in the fall of the Philippines, became a prisoner of war, under the Japanese and died uh, 
a prisoner of war. An academy grad, he was the captain of the football team in 1933-34. So in memory, the 80th anniversary of that, 2014, that season was dedicated to Lieutenant Crotty, and the football team actually put his name and a symbol representing him on their helmets for the 2014 year to maintain that relationship of what we call the long blue line. The Pacific had other stories as well. Those of you who know something about the United States Coast Guard know that the only Medal of Honor winner in Coast Guard history was Signalman First Class Douglas Monroe. His Medal of Honor sits here at the Coast Guard Academy. Douglas Monroe was killed rescuing Marines um, from Malioka River in Guadalcanal, 1942. He was killed in action. Right? Monroe Hall, where the SPO is and uh, where we have police activity and other personnel services, Monroe Hall here on the Academy base is named for Sigmund First Class Douglas Monroe. We also have relics and artifacts from the European theater. The large Nazi flag behind me represents one of the most interesting stories in World War II history. Lieutenant Commander Quentin Walsh, United States Coast Guard, was leading a small group of mixed service individuals on D-Day. His job was to scope out for Dumont and possibly seize one of the bridges near it. Sadly, he runs into a German garrison, outnumbering him about four to one. You don't want to play cards against Lieutenant Commander Quentin Walsh. He convinces the Germans to surrender. This is the flag that they hand over when he and his few little men march their garrison back toward Allied troops. The Second World War for the Coast Guard is also known for some of its amazing breakthroughs. In many ways, the Coast Guard led the armed services in terms of diversity. Here at the Academy is where many of the SPARs trained, S-P-A-R, Semper Paratus Always Ready, which is the Women's Coast Guard Auxiliary. Over 10,000 women volunteered for this. Here in the library, just across the hallway from the museum, we actually have diaries and journals from the women who were at the Academy during the Second World War. Fascinating stuff. The Coast Guard features the first integrated warship, the Sea Cloud. We're not talking about mess hands. We're talking about enlisted personnel and officers who are African American serving with white officers. And the jacket behind me belongs to a name that some of us, maybe the older types, remember. This is Alex Haley, who begins as a mess cook and ends up as a chief journalist in the United States Coast Guard. His stories in the Coast Guard and out become internationally recognized. Of course, there's no way to talk about the Coast Guard and World War II without talking about the Eagle. Here to my right, uh, to your, your left, uh, is the figurehead from the Horst Vessel. Some of you probably know, the Horst Vessel was built in Germany as a training ship for German officers, mechanics, and engineers in the 1930s. The Horst Vessel and several other training ships were taken as prizes by the Allies after the defeat of Germany. The United States government and the Coast Guard took the Horst Vessel. It stayed in Germany for almost a year, being refitted, supplied, prepped, was recommissioned the Eagle in 1946 and was sailed to the United States. The Eagle remains home ported here in New London and all cadets and all officer candidates sail on the Eagle. Uh, a big thanks to uh, uh, the class of 50 uh, uh, for its conservation efforts with the uh, original uh, figurehead. To my left and your right is something that is perhaps a little bit different than a giant figurehead. Right? This is a rotating display case. 
In this case, we put items of interest that might be representative of an anniversary or representative of, of some new item or some new artifact that the museum has collected. Um, for instance, uh, uh, here's a quilt signed by Coasties during the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We have a PB model uh, and a Chinese-built Vietnamese-used uh, AK-47 uh, from Coast Guard Service in Vietnam. These were brought out a few years ago for the 50th anniversary of the fall of Saigon. Uh, further up, we have some other items, including a logbook from the Marielle uh, operation, okay, uh, uh, 1980, the so-called Marielle boat lift from Cuba, okay, um, and some items from late 80s, or late 1970s, early 80s, uh, when the Coast Guard was called on to do some really unusual stuff. Uh, New York City, the longshoremen had gone on strike. The garbage was piling up. It was becoming a huge health hazard. And through a string of connections, the United States Coast Guard ended up taking out New York's garbage. Right? Uh, 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 within this case are some pennants, rather sarcastic pennants, devised by Coast Guard crew to sort of recognize their service uh, uh, during the great summer of the garbage haul from New York City. As I said, the, the port side, if you want to call it, uh, of the museum has rotating exhibits, talks about more contemporary items, uh, uh, things that are, are perhaps more memorable to, to cadets and families who are coming to the museum. Uh, here to my, to my left, to your right, uh, is a punt boat from Katrina. Okay? Uh, we just had uh, the 15th anniversary of uh, Katrina uh, and New Orleans. Uh, one of the largest single operations in Coast Guard history. In 2005, Coasties from all over the United States were brought down to the Gulf, worked with people they'd never worked with before, on platforms they had never worked with before, and pulled off all hosts of Coast Guard operations and missions. There was law enforcement. There was hazardous materials response. There were aids to navigation issues, and of course, huge search and rescue issues. In the span of just a few days, the Coast Guard rescued over 36,000 people. The connection to the academy is real. I know officers who are serving here later who met each other here, had worked in Katrina, talking to each other, but had never physically met. They ended up meeting here. I've worked with cadets who lived through this and joined the Coast Guard because of what happened at Katrina. Its impact is hard to exaggerate. On a lighter note, but just as eye-catching, is the giant inflatable unicorn behind me. Don't know if its impact will be similar to the, to the, to the hurricane responses that the Coast Guard has had to undertake. We had to include this because you may have heard about it. It was a huge star in social media this summer. You may remember earlier I spoke about a gentleman named Sumner Kimball. Right? Well, we have a security num uh, cutter named after him, right? the Coast Guard cutter Kimball. Well, the crew of the Kimball was on swim call this summer when the spotters noted shark fins in the water immediately called everybody out of the water. The boats went out, picked everybody up, got them out of the water before the fins closed in. But they had to leave the unicorn. There was no room in the boat. Coast Guard leaves no one behind. So once the spotters had dispelled the sharks with some well-placed firearms practice, right, they went back out and rescued the unicorn and brought it back in. Right? Big star now in social media has an honored place here in the Coast Guard Museum. As I may have said earlier, the Coast Guard Academy Library and Museum are unique in that they tell lots of stories about missions, but they also are unique in that the library and museum connects history with cadets. Some of it you've seen in my little tour here. 
Another example is the glass case behind me, much more explicit. Right? You see three blouses behind me. One of them, the dark blue one, is from the Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Allen. That's of less interest to me than the other two khaki ones. These are blouses worn by Coast Guard officers in Operation Iraqi Freedom in the Gulf. The top jersey is worn by Mr. Gregg, Ensign and then J.G. Tony Gregg, Operation Iraqi Freedom. After serving in the Gulf, he came to the Coast Guard Academy as an instructor in the Humanities Department. He taught morals and ethics. The blouse below, Lieutenant Dean Horton. After Lieutenant Horton came back from the Gulf, he came to the Coast Guard Academy and taught freshmen composition and literature. This is the kind of connection and culture we're hoping for at the Academy. That, that long blue line, that relationship among people and among generations. What I like to say here, and what these gentlemen said before me, at the Coast Guard Academy, we are training our replacements. We are looking for young women and men who are ready to do the kinds of things we have spoken about here. The museum and the academy are an incredible place, but it's the people that produce that special sauce. I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to run this tour. And I really wanna thank you on behalf of the entire institution for entrusting us with your daughters and your sons. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, I'm Jen Gaudio. I'm the curator here at the uh, U.S. Coast Guard Museum that's located in the Academy. You all have had uh, a tour with Dr. Zuchek. I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about certain artifacts that have a connection to both the Coast Guard and the Academy. Uh, this is what we call material culture which is using objects as historical documents to talk about a certain event or period in time. This is uh, a way we interpret history, placing together research and objects, photographs and images. So we've got three iconic pieces today to talk about. The first uh, object we have today, it belonged to the first commissioned officer in the Coast Guard. Thank you. Thank you, my excellent assistant. Uh, I'll take any volunteers I can get. Um, this is Hoffley Eaton's musket, as I was saying. It is dates to 1750. And it's the oldest firearm in the collection. Um, it is something he carried with him in the militia. It is something he carried with him in the revolution, and he carried it aboard Scammell. It might have belonged to his father because we believe Eaton was born in 1750. But that's not unusual. A gun like this would have been very expensive and very precious to uh, the family wouldn't just dispose of it, they would have hung on to it. In fact, that is how the museum received it in 1976 from Eaton's descendants. Uh, it is very interesting as it has, uh, we had the barrel scoped by uh, MSST Boston to check for black powder and they found that the barrel was rifled, which meant that it could not have been original to, uh, to Yeaton because muskets didn't have rifle, rifling was developed later. And um, we thought after we cleaned it, it revealed there's uh, some engravings we'll get a closer shot of uh, on the, firing mechanism that has the name of a merchant who is probably the gentleman who changed out the flintlock firing mechanism to a uh, 
percussion cap and must have changed the barrel at the same time. Among the descendants, it was known as the fowling gun because they went duck hunting with it. It is a 50 caliber weapon, and I'm not sure there was much duck left after 50 caliber bullet, but they also probably could have used um, scatter shot or some sort of shot pellets. Our next artifact is just about here. Can you bring it in, please? Thank you very much. This is Admiral Billard's sword. Billard was a graduate of the uh, Revenue Cutter School of Instruction, was superintendent of the academy, and was also uh, commandant in the 1920s for Prohibition. He was uh, one of the instrumental people in getting the campus this campus, the present campus, for the academy. Um, he was uh, very dedicated and he served until his death. Uh, it was, um, the sword is something that an officer would carry. And in this case, uh, you can see, um, there is, there it is. Sometimes I miss things in detail. But you can see that there is a U.S. RCS, which stands for Revenue Cutter Service. So this means it was before, given before 1915 when the service merged, when the co service, Revenue Cutter Service merged with the Life Saving Service to make the modern Coast Guard. And also his name is on it. Occasionally, his full name is Frederick Chamberlain Billard. Uh, when he, uh, sometimes these swords would be gifts from family members or friends or someone important in their life, and they would have their name engraved on, on it like Phil Billard did. His name, did you see his name? He's right there, that's the only thing I mentioned. Our last object is Douglas Monroe's Medal of Honor. Sigelman First Class Douglas Monroe received this medal for his sacrifice at Guadalcanal in September 1942 when he rescued several hundred Marines from being pinned down on the beach at, at Guadalcanal. But in some ways, it is more than just a medal. It also, I also like to mention his mother, Edith Thresher Monroe, who was, uh, upon hearing of her son's death at 47 years old, went and enrolled, uh, joined 
the Coast Guard spars and served until the end of the war. It actually also, we have several letters from uh, a correspondence from the director of the museum in the 60s and Mrs. Monroe discussing where they wanted, uh, where she wanted to bestow her son's medal upon her death. And it, we have several of the letters from her as well as his carbon copies. And it seems, as we piece them together, that his mother chose the academy because she wanted the officers to know of her son's sacrifice and what that meant. And the fact that the Coast Guard is only received one Medal of Honor does not detract from their bravery or honor. And this is one of the, what she wanted to show with it here. So we are uh, definitely honored to have it in our collection. These are uh, three distinct artifacts, one from the very beginning of the Coast Guard, one from the merger of the Coast Guard, and one that shows the ultimate sacrifice. Your children have a strong connection. They have the, there is roots to the service, and they have an honorable future ahead of them. So this is my thank you to you and to them for their service.